Thank you very much indeed for that um, rather generous introduction. Um, to be more succinct about the summary of my experience, all it means is that I'm pretty old. Um, I'm wanting to thank the organizers of this uh, event. For I, I am truly flattered to be invited. I, I haven't focused on Africa and South Africa for, I would say, decades. Um, I'm not sure if it's an advantage to come here in ignorance and to communicate to you a more global perspective or whether it's to my disadvantage. I think you can probably make your own decision about that after my three contributions. I think the organizers were pushing their luck a bit by me imposing me on three occasions to you. So uh, let's hope it doesn't backfire on all of us. Um, I'm going to treat this as a trilogy. I'm basically uh, going to kick off with a, a, a review of the context as I see it today internationally in the field of transport, urban development, and mobility. Uh, I'm going to communicate to you, uh, which is probably the most difficult task, before dinner or during dinner, I need to have some clarification on that, um, uh, the findings of our five-year program on decision-making on mega projects, which I think has some very major bearings on BRT projects as well as other projects here in South Africa and elsewhere. And then finally, uh, I'd like to conclude with some key parameters, prerequisites of a strategy that I have concluded is essential for us to make any progress. Now, anyone who's heard me talk before will know succinct is not my second name. And so I'm very wary of the chairman. He's already shown his teeth. Um, and I, the only way I've managed to cope with this, and I've already explained to him, is, what, is that I will get as far as I will get. You can have all my notes, and you can read the rest. I will nonetheless try and be sensitive to the time management, because I actually wanting to conclude on the latter part. And I say this because I'm cheating in a way. This presentation um, is based upon a book recent, well, 2011 was fairly recent, edited by Ralph Gackenheimer and I, who thought it would be useful some 20 years on since my first book to revisit the topic of trans urban transport development for the so-called developing world. And we brought in 18 other authors, all of whom I have the most high regard in, in the field of transport urban development in, in Latin America, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. And uh, what I'm going to do really is to present to you some of the features that we identified, Ralph and I, as the con today's context globally, uh, referring to the so-called developing world, and then um, give you a conclusion summary of what we felt all the 20, including Ralph and I, makes 20 contributors, where, where we are at, what the main messages were. And I only see these as ingredients of what um, the, uh, the, 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 the contributors concluded. Now, one of the major issues um, one of the major conclusions of the research that we undertook at the Omega Center is that is, is context is everything. Context, I repeat, is everything. In that today's 21st century globally and today's 21st century in South Africa needs to mold the way we deal with what we have before us and where we want to go. And that is a statement which sounds very glib, because actually there are many global perspectives here of how we should be viewing the present. We are being persuaded by all kinds of parties, some with vested interests, some with good intentions, to look at the world of transport and urban development in different ways. 
There is a great debate about what is developing about developing cities. Some argue that the concept is redundant and that we're all the same, but in different ways, have bits of each other's characteristics. But if you look at the profiles of what the more entrepreneurial class calls the emerging economies, you will find that there are characteristics that still stick. I think it goes, however, for the different um, countries to decide uh, what of these characteristics are important and should be uh, uh, addressed. Now, all I'm doing here is giving you some features I'm sure you already recognize, but I'm doing that for you to sort of say, yes, this is where we're at, or no, this is not where we're at, and more importantly, how important it is. Amongst the core features, we have rapid change, a presence of dysfunctional misfit among different parts of the urban systems. And you note, I'm talking about urban systems that includes water, energy, transport, uh, and information technologies. Um, the biggest aspect that I would labor that is too often ignored by outside investors is the existence of substantial populations of poverty. And that diagram that the young lady drew up there about risks, disastrous risks, one doesn't have to be a philanthropist to be concerned about marginalizing the poor even further through our transport investments. So I say it from both perspectives. <clears throat> we have motorized vehicle ownership of speeds we've not seen before. We've seen dramatic changes in spatial, temporal characteristics, trip patterns. We've had evolving land use patterns which dramatically change in densities um, in different parts of the cities. We've had new technologies side by side with old, one getting in the way of the other, so the traffic engineers tell us. We see um, a failure by governments and investment banks to properly appraise projects. We see increasingly planners being blamed for this lack of coordination. It's all, always easy to get the scapegoats. I think those of us who are planners know what our function in life is. Um, but we have a failure of planning overviews being uh, blamed as a result of these situations. We're having f new forces of globalization changing the very meaning of industrialization. We're seeing space change, market forces change us change space, change societies, change economies. Uh, we're seeing spawning environmental problems, a lot of rhetoric about how to deal with them, nonetheless spawning, and we see uh, inadequate efforts to deal with these adversaries um, it also, uh, particularly with regard to social justice. That's a fairly daunting set of miserable observations, perhaps, but, you know, that's where we concluded we are. Let's move on. This disjoint has led to motorization of, if you see in China, but if you also see in India and, and here South Africa, of, of proportions not seen before. We, we've, we've seen, I'm um, repeating some of these points, land use densities on the periphery, uh, especially becoming lower, and we're seeing um, the world economic roles of developing cities rapidly being changed. Some would say being changed in a way where their future is taken out of their own hands. We're seeing uh, through this rapid economic change, a diverse um, personal economic con conditions transpiring where uh, numerous transport modes and simultaneous use use public ways. So you've got bicycles, anim animal tractions, high-speed cars competing, impeding each other for the space. And we've already made reference to the poverty uh, issues that are seriously important if we are to make any uh, major changes, any meaningful major changes in, in, in poorer communities. I suppose where we are here today is to address the inability of many authorities to meet these challenges. The inability 
of authorities to address these, place a cloud over efforts at enhancing mobility and sustainability of our cities. Indeed, it was not, long so, uh, not so long ago when we were even told by the World Bank that the public sector was malfunctional and the private sector was better at doing everything. I think that they've changed their tune a little bit, but let's not forget what they did say before and how they were dishing out money in the name of that belief. So, as if that wasn't enough, we're also seeing disagreements amongst professions as to how to deal with these challenges. And we had some mention this morning about silos. We have many growing uh, numbers of consultants, NGOs, many of them well-meaning, but actually pulling cities, communities in different directions. And we see the incidence of politics in which competing objectives take a toll on, con on addressing concerns of mobility with vested interests making matters worse. Here, yet again, a focus of this event is the imperative that politicians and policymakers need to gain a strategic perspective of this set of complex tasks. If anything the military can teach us is that where you have complexity, you need a strategy. One can't deal with the minutiae outside of a strategy. I'm going to quickly skip on um, to uh, report to you what the co-authors concluded. While communication and learning jointly from international experience has a long way to go, there are certain signs of some success. And uh, however unhappy we might be about the operationalization of sustainability concept, the truth of the matter is it has taken off, it has taken root. Um, but of course, uh, now the real challenge is how do you translate visions, principles into local operational success? We have seen, um, and BRT is an example of this, we have seen demonstration projects which promote concept sustainability. We've seen uh, initiatives of road pricing. We've, we've, we've had some global, if you like, successes. But beyond the traditional concepts of sustainability, if there is such a thing, we've got some other themes that are pressing on us. One of these themes is the global rhetoric, reality, choose the words as you wish, depending where you are, of making cities more competitive, enabling cities to absorb larger labor markets, leading to better participation in the globalization project. We have also see the need to enable cities to emerge as new platforms of advanced technologies. And here, so we are told, the emerging economies offer new opportunities where some of the old economies don't. And we then see the attraction to generating specialized settings for logistical centers in metropolitan regions. So what we're seeing here is a set of global forces which is creating a new economy, new technologies, new spaces, new lifestyles, new priorities that needs to be set against the sustainability agenda. Instead, what we find is rhetoric tells us that they are in line with each other and I still find this very difficult to comprehend. Whereas on the one hand, we are competing against each other and on the other hand, we're creating cohesion in our infrastructure. Something doesn't add up. I am delighted. I am more than delighted. I'm coming from Britain, which is the neoliberal center or one of them in the world. I'm delighted to see that the vision of cohesion and infrastructure being the basis for creating cohesion still alive and kicking and thriving here. And I do think in this regard, it may well be that the global south 
is going to teach some of us in the global north about how to maintain the vision of the future. Okay, so that's the context. Please feel free to comment later on if you wish to me uh, well, in discussion as to how you relate to any of that. Let's quickly run through then the conclusions, uh, some of which I've quickly touched on. The first one, going back to my point about the power of context, is that we are seeing dramatically changing context for our urban trans transport systems as we speak. So our trend planning of the past, our trip mating patterns of the past, will and may not bear any future to what we could do in the future. And in this regard, we need to think outside the box. Trend planning needs to be revisited as a redundant exercise. Secondly, already mentioned, there is no way, in my view, one can underemphasize the risk, the challenge of global warming to the environment. Even as a banker, I have bankers listening to me, which is quite a surprise, in that these issues do challenge risk their very investments for the next 30 years. The fast train projects in London going to the southeast is in a floodplain. Its uh, infrastructure investment is for 50 years more. There are going to be implications. What we see, and I say this as the 18 authors plus Ralph and I, is a call for holistic thinking, not fragmented thinking, not thinking of the market alone, in order to create visions. We need to reappraise, which is no news here to anyone in this room, the role of the motor car. We need to improve, again, nothing new to anyone here in this room, and expand the role of formal public transport supported by informal public transport and non-motorized movement so that the two can support each other in the best way that they can, not necessarily compete. There needs to be a wake-up call, which even our global bankers have not realized, to the concept of sustainable economic growth sustainable financial fiscal prudence. The word sustainability is not an environmental concept alone. It has to do with economics. Short-termism is what it is, short-term. We need to invest infrastructure in the long-term, but at the same time, exploit the resources, influences, advantages, interested parties in short-term gains. And I'll talk about this in my last presentation on Tuesday, whereby we need to have a strategy where we exploit short-term actions that have positive long-term implications and avoid at all cost short-term actions that lead to long-term economic uh, negativities. We do know which is which, but we have to get ourselves rid of the rhetoric. The clock is ticking. We do not have the time we thought we had to deal with all this set of constraints. Because as we speak, as we think about our new strategy, others are implementing their short-term strategies. The call to focus on the alleviation of urban poverty and social equity is, as I have already pointed out, exceedingly important in cities, parts of the world, where these numbers are growing. This is not a philanthropic position. This is a risk to investors. This is a risk to politicians. And actually, the inclusiveness needs to have a social cohesion whereby the marginalized are less marginalized or not marginalized, rather than have market-led infrastructure projects that provide enhanced mobility for the affluent and leave the marginalized, even more marginalized. There are implications. I think this has been understood in Latin America. It hasn't been understood in London. Ironically, the prices of public transport are zooming up, and we have very high indices of accessibility. But what no one talks about, even the London mayor's office, is the affordability. Anyone of you been to London recently? The affordability of this higher level of accessibility. Somehow, the word affordability is not there. 
somehow the word affordability is not in the banker's jargon when it comes to infrastructure projects. The winners and losers need to be very clearly articulated geographically and socio-economically. Socio not only do we need better planning and project development management, but we need new tools for appraisal, which are multi-criteria in nature, which actually have apples and pears compared together. You choose between an apple and pear every day. Well, maybe not every day unless you're a very healthy person but you choose between incompatible choices. Somehow we have to, we are told, monetize everything before we can make these choices. That's not how reality is. The, cho the choice is in the politicians, the choice is in the cities, is to make appraisals where you understand what is an apple, what is a pear, and why you are choosing to subsidize the oranges. Uh, there needs to be a record transparent record of why you are subsidizing, for which reason, towards which policy, for what strategy, and who the winners and losers are. What we have at the moment is this very limited, and that's being polite, tool called cost-benefit analysis, which is supposed to tell us all of this in one ratio. Don't misunderstand me, those of you in the Treasury here. I saw someone shaking their head. Don't misunderstand me. Cost-benefit ratio is very important for those who put money in and looking at the financial costs and the financial returns. But that is one stakeholder, and they are very powerful. But there are other stakeholders who are looking at other dimensions. And at the end of the day, the cost-benefit ratio needs to sit side by side with other appraisals and decisions need to be made, which is where political leadership comes into play. Political leadership has to be responsible to resources. We talked about affordability. So when one makes choices of subsidies, they need to be affordable. They need to know where the resources are being transferred to in order to make these choices. Coming back to the theme of this workshop, this event, is this call for greater political commitment and consensus for new solutions. The role of politicians, policy makers, especially in the field I've been researching the last few years, five years, the mega projects, big projects, the role of political champions, both negative in terms of, well, sorry, let me re rephrase that. The role of politicians is extremely significant. They can make a project on the basis of their own reputation and, as Michael Heseltine did in the UK, completely ignore cost-benefit analysis for the Channel Tunnel Rail Link in the name of achieving South East England's regional development strategy linked to the European economy. There's no cost-benefit ratio that encaptures that. Or you can actually have projects where politicians are trying to make short-term gains out of political reputations and they're more concerned with cutting the ribbon rather than leaving a legacy that is positive for the community and the investors uh, uh, involved. So here we need to entice politicians, those of you who are here today, I'm privileged to have this opportunity and I don't mean to offend, but politicians need to do much more in understanding and being wi willing to listen to complexity because we are confronting complex issues and sustainable transport challenges and all the agenda that surrounds it. Simplicity, the media was raised today. Another finding of our research is that the media and politicians want sound bites, want simple responses, bottom lines, and we know that these problems are complex. Academics have made an industry of complexity, of analysis, maybe even paralysis. What needs to take place is that the two who have intention of making something happen get together in order to find out 
how demonstration projects can move ahead. And I think today's event is one such case. I will be referring at the end of my uh, presentation on Tuesday to a multi-criteria policy-led framework that we are working on with the European Investment Bank to help do that. <clears throat> I think I'm almost finished. I don't know if it's the first time uh, for many, many years I'm finishing before time. So this is quite an achievement, if nothing else. <laughs> <clears throat> what is interesting here about political commi commitment is that you need to look in geography and in history to see which politicians have provided such leadership. I'm sad to say that some of the political champions of big projects that are successful haven't always been the nicest of guys. So, you know, this, this idea that to be a political champion, uh, you also are considerate and sensitive. But nonetheless, there is political champions do need to exist. And more importantly, the, you, you do need to pass on the baton from one administration to the other. Now I'm on to my last slide, so we're, we're almost there. Another focal point of this event, which chimes, I think, very positively, is that as globally the infrastructure field, transport in particular, is looking to increasing private sector investment because the public sector is running out of loot, partly because the private sector have taken it, but that's another discussion. <laughs> the fact that they are in greater need of private sector investment leads to a very significant issue. And I place this as one of the biggest risks of public-private partnership insufficient skilled capacity in the public sector to deal with the private sector. The next message is to the private sector, and many of people I know working in this field, the private sector need good people in the public sector so they can make profit. So this is not an either or, this is one where both parties need each other to move ahead. So, on that conclusion, um, I think there's a place for everyone here. This old public-private competition uh, is a non-discussion. What we need to do is to have a vision, to have a strategy towards that vision and operationalize it. And the idea that this vision should be the same everywhere is absolute nonsense. The fact of the matter is there needs to be more local inputs into the global rhetoric or generic models of sustainability. So, what do I say here is my last paragraph. I better read it. The preceding observations and conclusions, that's of my colleagues, really, because these conclusions I read out to you were synthesized from the chapters of the book that we uh, recently published. Preceding observations, conclusions suggest that there is hope for the 20th century, because some people think there isn't. Um, but it really is heightened that... that, that, that we are at a juncture, and I think that the climate change and the energy and the, uh, and the global energy potential crisis and the global financial crisis are all suggesting if we're not careful, we could find ourselves in the perfect storm without a manner of coping with it. But now we are aware, what I'm speaking, what I'm saying today, I'm sure many of you in this room would also say, this is not new. Now we know this is where we are at. We actually can't fiddle around with urban design projects. I have nothing against urban design, but we can't start fiddling around with designing the deck chairs whilst the Titanic sinks. We actually need to take some hard strategic decisions. We need to know who are the winners and losers are and who we want, and we need to be careful when we do business with the private sector insofar as use the private sector short term specialists, because there are two categories, those who are in the long-term investment game and those in the short-term, do not be knowledgeable about who the private sectors are, where their expertise lies. If you want short-term experts, go for the short-term. If you want long-term experts, go. For, you need to know. The public sector needs to know who to go to, how to exploit the private sector's resources so that we can move ahead. Doing what we did before, BRTs or not, is not going to get us there. 
we need to make some quantum strategic leaps. And I actually think from the discussion today that I think that you probably know this more than I do. Thank you very much.